Welcome back, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here with you once more. Thanks for tuning in to the China History Podcast, part six this time in our 18-part series covering the history of Chinese philosophy. We're still in the classical period of Chinese philosophy. All the oldest and most sacred texts from the Shang and Western Zhou dynasties have been picked over the last few centuries. And then along came Confucius, who saved the day when everyone was starting to ask, what in the heck do these old books have to do with anything to do with us in our day? Confucius reintroduced these traditions and shone a spotlight on these texts and taught that these words were still relevant. I want to say right now that although Confucius made a big splash late in his day and had attracted a lot of talented students, not everyone thought his teachings were so great. One of those, credited with being the first important naysayer of Confucianism, was Mozi, also known as Modi. He lived from 470 to 391 BCE, which means he was born about a decade after the death of Confucius, which also made Mozi a contemporary of Socrates and Plato over in the West. Like Confucius, Mozi came from Lu, from a non-aristocratic background. And like all these other philosophers, he was an official. He served in the state of Song and had acquired quite a following, especially among the military men who were in the employ of various feudal lords. These were educated men, like most knights errant, but didn't have any aristocratic blood running through their veins. They were Mozi's core followers, and it said they were a very organized, militant lot, a very disciplined community, almost like a cult with considerable geographic reach. Each group was overseen by a grand master. Mozi was very big in his day, just as well known in the land as Confucius had been when he was still alive. And he had a solid reputation for being someone who practiced what he preached. As Confucius idealized Yao, Mozi's role model was Yu the Great, founder of the Xia dynasty. Mozi's philosophy is called Moism, and his followers are called Moists. They all hung their hat on several basic tenets taught in the 53 chapters that make up the work for which he is known, eponymously called the Mozi. Master Mo said there was only one standard for everything, one objective moral standard, above all, for right and for wrong. The Mo Tzu sums up Master Mo's teaching in ten theses. Like all these books, the author and the true creator of the content, most likely not the same people. The signature aspect of Moism was Mo Tzu's concept of universal love or inclusive care. He taught that was the answer. All people should love all people equally. That was the only way to solve the terrible problems plaguing society in these warring states' years. And Mozart was very anti-war, and despite the militant background of his core followers, he said the only wars worth fighting were those defensive in nature. This quasi-religious, militant community of Moists would sometimes go out and aid those states in dire need due to invasion by a bigger neighbor. They would provide all this expertise in defending against aggressors. Moists embraced pacifism, and for this reason, Mozart's thought was the preferred choice of all pacifists. Make love, not war, would have been Mozart's slogan. You may consider all this anti-war, universal love thinking to be a good thing, but back then, people who thought this way were considered crackpots and way out on the political fringe. Some government officials even considered them anarchists. The legalists, who we'll get to later, scoffed at Mozza and assured him his vision of universal love was a pipe dream and that war would always end up being the final arbiter in political struggles. The Moists really turned their noses up at Confucianism. And let me say, the feelings were mutual. Mozza taught that all of this teaching from these dusty old books just couldn't be more useless and impractical in their day. He described the Confucianists this way. They were, quote, indolent and arrogant, self-indulgent in drinking and eating and too lazy to work. He often suffers from hunger and cold and is in danger of freezing and starvation, but lacks the ability to avert them. 
He behaves like a beggar, grasps like a hamster, stares blankly like a he-goat, and rises up like a pig. When the gentlemen all laugh at him, he becomes angry and exclaims, What do undisciplined men know about a good Confucian like me? In spring and summer, he begs for grain. After the five grains are gathered, he resorts to conducting funerals. When a death takes place in a rich family, he will rejoice greatly, for it is his opportunity for clothing and food. End quote. Confucius lionized the old sages and the old ways. But Mauza said they had no practical place in society, and he sought to replace Confucian thought with something less complicated and more approachable. Mauza said the Confucianists ruined the world in several ways. Firstly, Confucianists rejected that gods existed. Mauza believed in gods, ghosts, and spirits, and that Tian, or heaven, was the ultimate moral guide for humankind. He also said Confucianists were too strict with ceremonies and rituals. He noted, for example, the three-year period of mourning of one's parents as especially impractical, not to mention wasteful. Mozart was also totally against the Confucian idea that everyone's fate was already predetermined and that everyone should know their place. Mozart said this kind of thinking was totally out of step with the times. You see, the people who generally followed the Confucian way and those of the Maoist persuasion saw eye to eye on about as much as hardcore liberals and conservatives do today. For example, Mozart's notion of universal, all-embracing love was totally rejected by the Confucianists. Mozart said, love everyone equally. Confucianists thought, this couldn't be more out of line. How could you love a stranger the same as a parent or a relative? Confucianism called for discriminating love. There were gradations as far as who should matter more to you and of your relations, who was due a greater degree of love. Mois were characterized by their commitment to these ten theses. Mozart believed people naturally gravitated towards correct behavior. Selfishness was the root of all evil, and all-embracing love was the antidote to that. To ensure this kind of behavior, education was necessary to keep people ethical and moral. A sampling of these Moist Ten Theses essentially promoted the following points of view. There should be a meritocracy. High-up positions should be open to everyone and should not be denied to people of low birth who demonstrate the correct moral behavior and competence. Mozart was against wasteful spending and called for moderation in all matters concerning luxuries and unnecessary expenditures, of which elaborate funerals, music, and the arts were considered part of that category. Rituals, too. Mozza said that, even though they didn't work and were too inflexible, they were still something positive for the way they brought families and all of society together in the shared participation. Confucianists believed Tian, or heaven, was a moral force, but it did not get involved in humankind's affairs. Not so, said Mozza. Heaven rewarded the good and punished the bad. And as far as his political philosophy was concerned... Mozart said it was the state's role to define this standard. No surprise, the Moists favored dictatorship over democracy. And when we get to Mengzi in a moment, you'll see he's no fan of democracy either. Mozart maintained that a dictatorship was the best way to set up a government, but that the dictator served at the will of the people and of heaven. And the reason the whole yellow and way river valley was awash in chaos was because of the dearth of capable rulers. A ruler's main job description was to spare the people from chaos and to govern with the idea of impartial concern for the welfare of the people. Impartial concern. Everyone was the same. Moism, though it had a significant impact on early Chinese thought, didn't survive as a major school. It wasn't outright rejected. History books all seem to suggest that after the Qin dynasty, Moism died off and its various philosophies absorbed by other schools. And why Moism didn't survive beyond the Qin? Well, we'll get to that in good time. There's nothing wrong with imagining the kind of utopian world that Mozart envisioned. Like Confucius, he said it all began at the top with the leader. There had to be someone who was going to set a solemn example for the people. And from his example, 
all of society will fall in line and everyone will help one another. Now, without anyone looking, let's quietly and surreptitiously sneak out the back door here with Moism and move on to another philosopher, 30 years younger than Mozart, but their lives had plenty of overlap. I have to say, of all the philosophers I picked over, from Yu Zi to Wang Yangming, this one intrigued me the most. He lived from 440 to 360 BCE, again, Socrates and Plato times. He lived sort of in between Mozi and Mengzi. His name was Yang Zhu. As I familiarized myself with Yang Zhu, I couldn't help marveling that he was teaching these words more than 24 centuries ago, and the same words could have been said today in our day. Yang Zhu had an interesting and colorful way of looking at the world and how humankind should conduct themselves. First of all, whenever you read about Yang Zhu, the caveat is always mentioned that says everything there is to know about him, and Slim Pickens, baby, is all it is, too. It was all said by his enemies, guys like Meng Zi. We only know of him through the words written about him by others, and no one was terribly complimentary. Mo Zi thought Confucius was wrong, and Yang Zhu thought both of those two were wrong. What did he say that was so eye-opening? Late in the 5th century BCE and into the 4th, Yang Zhu summed his philosophy up in a way that reminded me of what Alvy Singer said in Annie Hall. I'm paraphrasing, but he compared life to the quality of the onboard meals you used to get on an airline. The food was terrible in such small portions, too, meaning life was hard and filled with misery, and before you knew it, it was over all too soon. Therefore, Yang Zhu said it was humankind's sole purpose in life to counteract this potential misery by pursuing pleasure and to enjoy a good time. Yang Zhu said, there's no God, no afterlife. This is it. Once you're gone, you're gone. And no matter how many monuments to your own personal glory you leave behind, you ain't going to be there to hear people pass it on the street and talk about what a great person you were. Wise people will accept that they are like a tumbleweed, blown wherever the forces of nature take them. Furthermore, he completely rejected Confucius, Mozza, and all these rue scholars who taught about humans' inherent virtue and all-embracing love. Who were they kidding? Yang Zhu even went as far as to say all this talk of ethics and how people should act is just a ruse or an excuse for the simple-minded to be manipulated by the educated elites. Like Confucius, Yang Zhu agreed that those were good times in the early Zhou. But Yang Zhu parted ways with Master Kong when he said everything went south in China after all these philosophers burst onto the scene, wandering all over the country, spreading their impractical theoretical nonsense. The marquee story from the life of Yang Zhu that sort of encapsulates his view on how we should all live our lives concerns the stories of Shun, Yu, and Confucius, as well as the two poster boys for evil sovereigns. I mentioned them before, Jie and Zhou Xin, the final rulers of the Xia and Shang dynasties, respectively. Yang Zhu's reasoning was this. He said such morally stand-up guys like Yao and Shun never had an easy day in their lives. In trying to achieve all they did in helping the people, life was a daily struggle with sadness and suffering. Yu the Great, well, his story was well known, to deal with the floods, he was on the clock constantly, never taking a break, even forsaking his own family and his determination to tame the Yellow River floods. A lot of good his morals and virtuous did for him and Shun. As for Confucius, well, in the sage's own lifetime, he was mocked, disrespected, and ignored wherever he went. All these sages were perfect examples of virtue. Yet look at how they struggled and never got to enjoy any of the fruits of their righteousness. Yang Zhu pointed out that those men had been revered and hailed as perfect models for anyone to follow. But for what, asked Yang? They're dead and gone and therefore oblivious to all the accolades that have been heaped on them since their passing. Yang Zhu then points to King Jie of Xia. He inherited wealth, 
got to be king, lived a life of pleasure and debauchery. Same with Zhou Xin. They did nothing except pursue a life of selfish pleasure. They died. We all die. And in death, their venality and evil lives on, always pointed to as a reminder to people about what happens when they act like they did. But Yang Zhu says, those two kings are as dead as Shun and Confucius, and they have no idea that they've been turned into role models for licentiousness and evil. Who had the better life in the end, Jie and Zhou Xin, or the paragons of virtue who are held up to all people as the models for how we should think and conduct ourselves? Yang Zhu said people should just act naturally in your own self-interest, and don't blindly follow these social niceties. Do what's best for you. These rituals, traditions, beliefs, and listening to these sages from 500 years ago, eh, it ain't going to help you. If you see something, take it, if it's going to make you happy or give you some pleasure. Thankfully for Kong Zhe, he did not live to hear Yang Zhu expound on this rather hedonistic philosophy. Hedonism? That's the pursuit of pleasure and happiness. Pleasure is the highest good. This was Epicureanism's embarrassing relative. What a world it would be if we all thought like Yang Chu. But from a Taoist perspective, eh, he wasn't so bad. If self-preservation was the innate way for humans to act, then why go against what only came natural? Confucius didn't live to hear Yang Chu, but Meng Zhe did. And there's this famous snippet from the Mengzi, where he laments that, quote, the words of Yang Zhu and Mo Di fill the world. If you listen to people's discourses about it, you will find that they have adopted the views of one or the other. Now, Yang's principle is each for himself, which does not acknowledge the claims of the sovereign. Mo's principle is to love all equally, which does not acknowledge the peculiar affection due to a father. To acknowledge neither king nor father is to be in the state of a beast. If their principles are not stopped and the principles of Confucius set forth, their perverse speaking will delude the people and stop up the path of benevolence and righteousness. I am alarmed by these things and address myself to the defense of the doctrines of the former sages and to oppose Yang and Mo. I drive away their licentious expressions so that such perverse speakers may not be able to show themselves. When sages shall rise up again, they will not change my words. End quote. Meng Zhe, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be getting to him in a minute. Meng Zhe wasn't the only 4th century BCE philosopher to heavily diss Yang Zhu. Han Fei, Li Si, and others rejected this thought. But as I said before I started discussing about Yang Zhu, all we know about him is what others wrote about him. None of his work survives. Like Yu Zi from Part 1 and many others throughout history, we only know of them and can read of their work only those bits that later writers wrote and what fate allowed to survive into our time. So Yang Zhu passed away in 360 BCE. Let's look at Confucianism after Confucius. The two greatest interpreters of Confucius during the classical period were Meng Zi and Xun Zi. Let's focus on Master Meng first. Meng Zi, born Meng Ke, came from the state of Zhou. Zhou bordered Lu to the south and today would be part of southern Shandong. He lived from 372 to 289 BCE, roughly the time of Aristotle in Greece and young Alexander the Great. We're in the Warring States period in China still, and as the countdown to 221 BCE gets closer, the times just keep getting worse. Some older Chinese around the world who went to a traditional Chinese school might remember the stories of Meng Zhe's mother pounded into them when they were young. Meng Zhe's mother, Meng Wu, she was put up on the highest possible pedestal and was forever pointed to as a living representation of virtue in what it means, in the traditional sense, to be the perfect mother. She was perhaps China's first tiger mom. Lots of stories featuring Meng Zhe's mother, and a few good Cheng Yu also. In fact, Meng Zhe in general, he appeared in more Chinese sayings than almost anyone. 
This is not a character that was unique to Mengmu. There were other women who were held up and praised as this idealized woman who was also a mother who puts everyone else's needs and interests before themselves, who thought their tears, sacrifice, and hardship clears the path for her children to be good and decent and to go on and thrive. There's nothing new. In Rome, for example, we could point to Cornelia Africana, mother of Tiberius and Gaius. Cornelia Africana isn't a household name, but when history buffs hear about the so-called mother of the Gracchi, they know what those four words signify. Oppressed Chinese women throughout the centuries? I guess you have Mengzi's mother to thank for making as big a deal as she did about the three obediences. These three obediences didn't necessarily enslave Chinese women for 2,000 years, but let's say it contributed no small amount to the limiting the career options that women had. Yeah, we have Meng Mu, who uttered the words, quote, It does not belong to a woman to determine anything for herself, but she is subject to the rule of the three obediences. When young, she has to obey her parents. When married, she has to obey her husband. When a widow, she has to obey her son. End quote. This was known as the San Tsong Si De, the three obediences and the four virtues. Not just these three obediences to the men in their life. Women had to maintain these four virtues, these si de, morality, de, physical charm, rong, propriety in speech, yen, and efficiency in needlework, gong. Mengzi's mother. Hmm, A tough act to follow. And on that note, let's take a break and reconvene in the next episode where you can be sure we will examine the life, deeds, and philosophical thought of Mengzi. After Confucius himself, Mengzi, or Mengxius, he's the biggest thing there is in Confucian philosophy. Yeah, I might be able to squeeze Xunzi in too. We'll see. So, I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks one more time. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the City of Night, inviting you back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.